Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. Margaret Mayer was driving on Route 203 near the Winding Brook Golf Course near Kinderhook in New York when she saw a strange creature standing on the left side of the road. She noticed the eyes at first and thought that it was a deer as they were almost at ground level. Then it stood up and was then four to five feet taller than when she first saw it. It was not a person, with the eyes being small, but far apart. The Bigfoot looked straight at Margaret a couple of times. The creature only moved from the top part of its shoulders and the head. She did not notice any arms, and she could see the top of the legs, which were really skinny, and it looked deformed, yet it moved fast and did not seem to walk across the road, but moved across it like it was almost gliding. The eyes were yellow, and the head went straight into the shoulders, and there was also no neck. On to the next one. Martha Helen Beck saw round, white eyes that were seven and a half feet off the ground near her back porch at night. She describes them as bright white. On to the next one. A woman found large footprints in the snow near her 4th Avenue home in Whitehall. The tracks were bipedal and appeared to originate near the tree line and circled her house. On to the next one. Susan Helen Beck, a teacher at Ichabod Crane Middle School, was walking in the woods near Cushing's Hill when she heard strange vocalizations that sounded like the sounds of gorillas from the movie Gorillas in the Mist. On to the next one. In Whitehall, in Washington County, in New York, the witness encountered huge footprints in the wood, about 20 inches long, and found some tree branches broken down. Walking back to the house, they felt like they were being watched. The next morning, one of the witnesses woke up to see a huge, 10-foot-tall creature standing about 20 feet from the house. The creature wandered about for a while, it was brown in color and looked very human, except for its size and forehead and its hairy appearance. After about five minutes, it walked past the house and up a nearby bank. As it passed the house, it banged on the wall, awakening the other witnesses. On to the next one. in Chemung County in New York. The trail I was jogging on was at the base of one of the hills that surrounds the Chemung Valley. The trail itself was approximately one quarter of a mile long, fairly clear, about two feet wide, and surrounded by woods on both sides. The trail itself, as well as the hill, is located in the outskirts of the city proper. Actually, the town of Elmira versus City of Elmira. As it was very cold that evening, the snow was ice crusted and it was very easy to discern footsteps in the woods. There are a number of trails that diverge from this one that lead up and over the hill. The hill is probably 120 to 200 feet tall with a gentle slope. A good number of roads are in this area 
as it is residential. The most notable would be Route 352. This incident occurred in late February at approximately 10 p.m. The conditions that night were very clear and cold, with a fairly decent amount of moonlight. As I recall, there was about four inches of old snow on the ground, and as it was very cold that evening, the snow was ice-encrusted and made a good deal of noise when stepped on. I was jogging on a trail that is approximately one quarter of a mile long. The trail itself was fairly clear, about two feet wide, and ran across the base of one of the hills that surrounds the Chiming Valley. The surrounding area was heavily forested with a mix of trees common to upstate New York. The incident itself occurred when I was approximately halfway through the trail. At that point, the canopies of trees was very thick, and as I was running, I heard the distinct sound of footsteps about 20 or so feet into the tree line off to my right. Being slightly startled, I picked up my pace, but at that point believed that it was a deer in the wood. The trail itself is a common deer path. Although startled, I figured I had spooked a deer and expected to hear the deer receding into the wood in the opposite direction. Instead, I heard the footsteps move parallel to the direction in which I was running. This immediately sent a streak of fear through me as I have lived in upstate New York all of my life, and knew very well that a deer would bolt in the opposite direction of startled. I ran faster, and as I did, so did the footsteps in the woods quicken. Thinking that I may be hearing nothing than the echo of my own footfalls, I stopped dead in my tracks to test my theory. When I did, so did the steps continued for another two or three seconds, stopping slightly ahead of me and to my right. I stayed where I was for another ten seconds or so, trying to discern what the sound might mean, and while I waited there, I could clearly hear what sounded like a slight side-to-side -side movement off in the wood, as if someone was stepping from one foot to another, as if anxious. I attempted to see into the tree line, but could not see that far into the wood clearly. After about ten seconds or so, I began to jog again, and tried to convince myself I was just hearing things and was spooking myself. When I had gone about five feet, the footsteps began again. It was very clear to me that the sounds were coming from a biped as the footfalls sounded like that of a person versus a deer or a dog. What spooked me was that for every two to three steps I was taking, the individual, for a lack of better term, in the wood was taking one. I'm six feet four inches tall, and at that time, I was taking the longest strides I could. The thought that kept racing through my mind at the time was that it was either someone having fun with me, this thought was dispelled by the apparent giant strides I heard, or that I was alone in the woods with a psychopath with very long legs. No joke. The most unsettling element at the time was the fact that I'm over six feet tall and, at the time, weighed in excess of 250 pounds, mostly muscle. So I figured that whoever it was was not intimidated by my physical presence. I made record speed through the trail and exited onto a service road next to the local golf course. At this point, I ran another 10 feet or so into a clearing at the edge of the trail and stopped to look back into the woods. I continued to hear the footfalls until they stopped at the edge of the tree line. At that point, I was standing under a fluorescent light and, as such, lost any night vision I had acquired. Consequently, I could not identify any shape or form in the woods. I did clearly hear what sounded to be heavy breathing and a light throaty rumble. My initial thought was that it sounded like someone with a respiratory condition sitting in the tree line. I then heard a tree branch snap, and at this point I turned and ran at breakneck speed across the golf course, looking back over my shoulder every ten feet or so. 
At one point, I tripped, and remember thinking that tripping like that only occurred in the movies. A few minutes later, I exited the golf course onto one of the main streets in the town of Elmira, and have not used that trail at night ever since. At the time of the incident, I did feel extremely scared, but in retrospect, I feel like there was no real threat in the incident. Whoever or whatever was in the woods that night could have clearly done me harm if they so wished, but the entire time, whatever it was, stayed 20 or so feet off to my right. I have not given this incident a great deal of thought since the occurrence until I was reviewing Bigfoot encounters online and found sightings of Bigfoot in an area not too distant from my experience. I asked a friend of mine who lives in the area of sightings and what he knew about Bigfoot, and he indicated that for years people have stated that they have seen Bigfoot in the woods about 15 miles from where I was. I do not know if this was a Bigfoot, but something was in the woods with me that night, and from the sounds it made, it was too large to be a person, and it definitely wasn't bipedal. The incident occurred at approximately 10 p.m. at night. I was jogging through a trail at the base of one of the hills in our valley. The area was mixed forest common to upstate New York. It was late February, cold, and with about four inches of old snow on the ground. The night was cloudless and clear, and there was a fairly decent amount of light between the moonlight and its reflection off the snow. As noted previously, I was on a trail that cut through the woods at the base of the hill. The trail is approximately a quarter of a mile long and ends at the local golf course. The surrounding area is a mix of tree line, pine, maple, etc., common to upstate New York. The trail itself is a common path for deer, which I had initially thought was following me. The entrance to the trail is at the end of a dead-end street in a residential area, although there is no heavy traffic from humans, cars, and the area at the time of year. There are a number of ponds within a tenth of a mile or so from the trail on the golf course. There is one documented sighting that occurred in Alpine Junction, about 15 to 20 miles from where I was that night. Also, in asking around, I learned that the area of Alpine Junction has a local history of Bigfoot sightings. On to the next one. One enduring cryptozoological mystery is why Bigfoot sometimes fail to leave tracks where they clearly should. With weight often estimated upward of 500 pounds, these creatures should leave tracks in all but the hardest media, yet many do not. In 1962 in Ohio, a couple parked near Big Indian Creek to see a large figure walk through a barbed wire fence and approach the car. The creature is a seven-foot-tall, tan-colored Bigfoot with fangs and claws, albeit sickly or dead-looking. Snapping out of their daze, the couple rolls up their window and drives away, but not before the beast crouches in front of the car, hops up, and disappears. They return the next day but find zero evidence of the event, including footprints. In 1969, in Alberta, Guy LaRuth and Hurley Peterson are building a pump house foundation by the North Saskatchewan River when Peterson spies a tall, dark figure standing on top of a 300-foot-high bank about half a mile away and watching them. Both witnesses observe the figure for half an hour. When they finally investigate the area, they estimate the being's height at around 15 feet, but find no footprints. In 1975, in Utah, a couple in their mountain cabin 70 miles outside Cedar City notice a variety of strange noises, including a motor running every night. Early one morning, the husband hears heavy footsteps approaching the cabin 
accompanied by a huge, dark form moving outside the window. The witness opens the cabin door slowly, but sees no one outside and hears nothing retreating. What puzzles me is there were no footprints of any kind, and we have lots of snow here. He later told Alan Barry, My First Nation friend tells me it's the new put, meaning ghost in their language, and only a few will dare stay in the area overnight. In 1975, in Kentucky, during the Spotsville Monster sightings, a neighbor visits the Nunnelly family and tells them he encountered an eight-foot-tall Bigfoot the previous summer. He fired his rifle 16 times at the creature through his screen door. It just walked off without making a sound, he tells them. The neighbor found neither blood nor footprint, not even a single footprint, and it had to weigh at least four or five hundred pounds. Perhaps the most famous Sasquatch to never leave tracks is the large hairy hominoid that stalked a home in Rochdale, Indiana. Beginning in August 1972, Lou Rogers and her son Keith started hearing odd vocalizations on their property, beginning as animalistic growls and hoots before shifting to more human sounds. Whatever had made the noises seemed now to be breathing down her neck, wrote Jerome Clark of one early incident. She turned around slowly, but could see nothing. Thoroughly shaken, she and Keith fled into the house. Unbeknownst to Lou, her brother had observed a luminous object land in a nearby cornfield 90 minutes earlier, before disappearing in a flash. This cornfield would serve as ground zero for the Rochdale Bigfoot. The Rogers' home soon came under assault from slaps and taps on the siding and windows. Soon after, the six-foot-tall creature began appearing nightly between 10 and 11.30 p.m. for three weeks. You could feel it coming somehow. It's hard to explain, Rogers said. The feeling would just keep getting stronger and stronger. And then, when it got strongest so you knew something had to happen, the knocking would start. The creature was sometimes seen peering through windows, giving the impression of a broad, bipedal gorilla with intermittently glowing eyes. It never left any physical evidence, however. Rogers said what was weird was that we could never find tracks even when it ran over mud. It would run and jump, but it was like somehow it wasn't touching anything. When it ran through weeds, you couldn't hear anything. And sometimes when you looked at it, it looked like you could see through it. The only footprints ever discovered were tiny three-inch tracks of a foot and a stub. Other Rochdale residents began seeing the creature and the strange activity started ramping up. Lou found a plastic flying saucer toy in her home, which did not belong to Keith. The creature shrugged off shotgun blast. Animal pens and gardens were raided. An officer told Jerome Clark he believed tracks were never found because the ground was hard and the vegetation was high. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much and until next time, bye!